I'm delighted to say I'm joined here today with podcaster, producer, writer and Jersey mogul Paul John Dykes. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks for coming along. We're here to discuss your fourth book today, The Celtic Jersey. Tell us a bit about it. The Celtic Jersey, for me, it's iconic, worldwide. Um, you could be on holiday anywhere in the world, you see a set of hoops and you've found a friend. But for some reason, no one had written a book about it. And I got an opportunity when I was doing my second book to access a, a huge, vast collection of old Celtic jerseys that belonged to Neely Mockin, who was the kit man for about 30 years at Celtic, as well as an iconic player and coach of the Lisbon Lions. Um, and in accessing that collection, I had this idea, it needs to be captured, it needs to be a book. And then after that, post-94, I've got a few other collectors to fill in the blanks. So it's been a seven-year project, Kerry. So seven years. So you must be catching mm. up on all the, the best Netflix programmes just now yes. then. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's what I was just saying. I, I'm, I'm now catching up on PLZ. Obviously. Yes, of course. Uh, I didn't have a chance to watch anything or do anything at night. Right. There was a few all-nighters pulled to mm -hmm. make it uh, happen. And it's great to now see it. So it's right up to date. So it's right up to this season. And obviously, um, maybe in five, ten years, they'll want another edition. There you go. Will you say yes or no to that? It depends <laughs> on my sleep pattern at yeah, that stage. Exactly. If I can uh, pull all-nighters. But the thing is, you forget about all that once you get the book in your hand. Exactly. And you start looking through it. And it's been brought together really well by the publishers. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a really uh, beautiful book to go through. Um, it was almost like two books in one because you had to collect the jerseys, get them photographed, um, and then write about them. Yeah. Now, as you'll know, you know, for many a year, since 1903, Celtic have had green and white hoops, and often the jerseys don't change much. Mm -hmm. So to try and write 500 words about a, a jersey that's had a tiny wee dash added to it uh, was something of a challenge, but I enjoyed every moment. It was a yeah. labour of love. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you've come across quite a few iconic jerseys mm -hmm. through your research making the book. Do you think some jerseys are associated through success? Absolutely. Um, and I think... The lime green jersey, people just associate that with Love Street, 1986. The centenary jersey, you, you associate it with the double, with, with players like Paul McStay and Frank McAvenny. And then the season that resulted in us not winning the 10 in a row, uh, the jerseys were beautiful, but we don't look back on them with any fondness. Uh, all three jerseys were brilliant, beautiful designs. But as I say, you can't really enjoy them because we lost the league that season. Yeah, you kind of mentioned it there. Have you found any jerseys that are just more popular through the player that wore them? I think so, because when you look at uh, some of the jerseys that, for example, Henrik Larson wore, they weren't classic designs, but in time they have become iconic because yeah. uh, Larson, with his dreadlocks and with his skinhead, um, made them look good, didn't he? Because he was such an iconic player. And I think that the 90s have got a lot to answer for. Yeah. Uh, not only were Celtic pretty poor, but the jerseys were crazy designs from Umbro. Um, but again, in time, they've become cult classics. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting um, story from start to finish. The away jerseys often more interesting than the home, but those green and white hoops, you think to yourself, you know, you, you can't tarnish them. But some of the manufacturers tried their best. You've went back quite some time with the book. What's the oldest jersey you've found and who wore it? It was uh, 1930s and it was Jimmy Delaney okay. who had uh, also played for Manchester United. And these jerseys often turn up at, at auction houses and they go for tens of thousands of pounds at times. Uh, that was the oldest one. But the jersey Celtic wore from the 30s, we wore it right up until the early 60s. Such was the, you know, the lack of marketing back then. They just wore the same jersey year in year out and they would replace it by going down to a local sports shop and buying it um, so although they were umbro jerseys mm -hmm. there was no such thing as a kit deal back then it was only when you know England winning the World Cup uh, Celtic winning the European Cup that deals started coming in because uh -huh. they realised that there was a market for replica jerseys then um, so that was the oldest jersey and we managed to get the jerseys right up to this season so we've got Callum McGregor's home jersey mm -hmm. Kyogo's away jersey Yakamakis's third jersey, all in that book as well. Have you got a favourite from all that you've found? I do. There's a few that I'm really fond of. Um, you know, the Bumblebee kit, the original Bumblebee, people look back fondly on that. Strangely enough, we never won anything wearing it. <laughs> uh, but the centenary, home and away. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't my first shirt. I got jerseys before then. But I just think back to that time, um, through a golden haze, you think of games that are played in the sunshine. Scottish Cup finals were always sunny days. Uh, Mark of anyways, uh, blonde tints in his hair and all that, wearing this beautiful centenary jersey. But it was a bit of a throwback because it had the old granddad collar with a button. Yeah. 
um, and I look back really fondly on that. I love that shirt. And that's the kind of jersey now, if you go into the superstore, they've remade them mm -hmm. because people in my age are probably buying them for their kids and even their grandkids. Yeah. Well, one of the most popular Celtic strips is probably the Seville Cup final top. What do you think is so special about that top? There was probably a, a lot of years, like when I got into Celtic, Kerry, we were not a European force. Uh, I started watching Celtic in 1987. And you hear about Lisbon and the fact that we actually got to two European Cup finals, second being in 1970. But those days were long, long gone. And it took a long time for Celtic to, to be anywhere in Europe. So when it finally happened under Martin O'Neill, um, it was almost like a, a throwback to the glory days of the 60s and 70s. We were back into a European final. Uh, the run, we were the underdog. You know, we were coming up against... Uh, teams like Liverpool, who, you know, they fancied their chances. Blackburn, under Graham Soonis, fancied their chances. And uh, there was a few of our players who had a wee bit of point to prove. Sutton, for example, he'd come up to Scotland after a really poor kind of time at Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Hartson had come up, he'd been in injury plagued. Uh, he came up maybe with a point to prove and we knocked out a couple of English sides in the run. The run was phenomenal. The final was disappointing, but... As a fan base, we went over and we won awards for being the best fans in Europe. And um, I think that the memory of Seville was that we were coming away from that thinking it's not the final time we're going to get to a European final. It's not happened. It was 20 years ago now. Um, but it was a classic jersey we wore yeah. that night. But I don't know if they, in 20 years' time, will be looked upon as being you know, cult classics. Mm -hmm. well, we talk about the, the kind of evolution of the shirts. Mm. And one thing, I think it was 2001, 2002 maybe, that the hoops had stopped under the arms, it was just a white underarm. What was your thoughts of that? Because I know a lot of Celtic fans weren't too happy yeah. about that design. It was sacrilege, you know, they broke the hoops. And doing the, the research, there were certain points in history where things were added and fans reacted. So the first thing that came along was the Umbro logo. Mm -hmm. and so when that was added, the fans weren't that first about it, to be fair. But the reason they did it was that that was the time when Umbro realised we could make money from selling replicas. So we need to put our logo on the hoops. And uh, because at that time, anybody could have sold a green and white hoop jersey mm -hmm. and Celtic fans would have bought it. And Admiral did that. Uh, so Umbro stuck their logo on. There was a bit of an outrage when we put our uh, badge on, the club crest, which sounds bizarre now, but that was uh, desecrating the hoops. And then in uh, the early 80s, CR Smith became the first sponsor and there was outrage People said they, were, they wouldn't come back while Celtic had sponsors on their jerseys. Um, so there's always been these moments, and you're quite right in what you say, the hoops were broken and Celtic fans were not happy. But we were playing under Martin O'Neill and we were winning leagues and it was quickly forgotten. And actually, when you look back, it was a, it was a really nice design. So um, there's a few rules that the manufacturers probably can't break, and one of them is don't break the hoops. And just throughout your research as well, how have you found the difference in fabric or the quality of the shirts throughout time? Well, going back to the early ones you mentioned, they were rugby jerseys. You know, they were really thick. Um, back in the 90s, everything was really baggy, but now it's all skin tight. So um, they're always coming up with ways. I know that one of your colleagues, Ruffy, would be aware of World Cup jerseys being different material because you were, you were playing abroad. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you had the tea bag jerseys, so there was wee holes to allow the... Yeah you know, the sweat to be released. So, yeah, they've, they've changed with the times. What's your least favourite? My least favourite is probably one of the um, the early 90s away efforts. Okay. The one I mentioned, how on earth anybody um, signed off the sponsor? It was red, white and blue. And if you can imagine that now in the modern day, and obviously I had to find out who signed it off, and it's in the book, so you know who to blame. There you go. Um, but anything on a Celtic jersey with red, white and blue... I'm sorry, I, I can't celebrate it. <laughs> and uh, do you think people's favourite strips are associated with the generation that they grew up watching? Without a doubt, I say the centenary year because that was the season I started going to the games. Yeah. So you look back um, through that golden haze, as I say, and you reminisce and you love it. And if you were to maybe put it aside this one or maybe this season's one, it's maybe not as smart. But you, you've just got those memories and the players that played, Tommy Burns, Roy Aiken, Paul McStay. Um, and I think that your own memories and you know reminiscing about your memories as a Celtic fan, um, you'll have these associations with certain jerseys. Now, every season there's three new, new tops. Mm -hmm. Are they as sacred? I don't know. I, I really don't. I think those days are gone. Yeah. What's your thoughts on the third kit then? Because we are talking about this before we started. Just... It's all about making money. It's a commercial decision. Um, now, back in the day, it's always been there. Umbro 
started making replica jerseys because they knew that Celtic fans would buy it. And they thought, well, we've got the kit deal, so why should Admiral make money from Celtic jerseys? So I, I understand all that. Um, but even if you look at the, the old photographs, you know, there's not many Celtic jerseys through various eras, and now it's become the norm. But they're so expensive. So to release three a year, I think it's a commercial decision. I get it. If they weren't selling, then they probably wouldn't do it. But now we know there's three jerseys every single year. But Kerry, it makes it difficult for the designers of the hoops. That's true, yeah. What can you possibly do that's not been done? Not much you can do. Just on to the book then. Seven years it took you. What did you enjoy most about writing the book? I met a lot of people that um, I thought I was really, you know, a, a massive Celtic historian and Celtic fan. And then you meet people who take it to another level. Mm -hmm. So it will remain nameless, but um, I went to photograph his collection. Yeah. And he lived in a three-bedroom house and his two daughters shared the bedroom because one of the other bedrooms was for his Celtic jerseys, right? <laughs> That's how committed he was. Um, so meeting these people who you regard as friends, you're still in touch with them. Some of them probably gave up hope that the mm -hmm. book was actually going to arrive. Um, so it was great for it to actually come and yeah. you could give them a copy. Uh, very loyal through the seven years. They're happy that the jerseys are in there. And there's a wee section at the end that celebrates the collectors as well. You probably gave up a lot of free time to put this book together. What was the most difficult parts about getting it together then? Probably, you know, two or three nights without sleep, Kerry. Um, the <laughs> deadlines, <laughs> the amount of deadlines I missed were, were unbelievable, right? Um, and at the time, it's like the end of the world. But now I'm looking back and think, I've got it done eventually. Every time I thought it was finished, three new jerseys came out. I then had to try and source them. That was becoming difficult because during the pandemic, jerseys were not being swapped. They weren't being given to fans as they do now. Uh -huh. um, and then the club stepped in and helped me out with that. So we managed to get the nine Adidas jerseys that originally I thought we weren't going to get. And that was really satisfying. Going up to the club and walking through that front door is always going to be satisfying for a Celtic fan. And uh, so they supplied it. And um, I'm glad they did because the Adidas kits have been really, really good. The designs are fantastic. I kid on about the grey one. Hopefully we don't, never wear it again. Um, and if we do, you know, maybe make sure it's against the team we're going to beat. For those who buy the book, what are you hoping that they get through the book? What are you hoping to achieve? I just think visuals are great. And it's like music. You hear a song, it takes you back to a moment in time. And I think football jerseys are like that. Some people might think that's a bit sad, but you see a jersey and you think of a player. I see this jersey, Paul McStay. Yeah. I just think of Paul McStay because, you know, he won a Scottish Cup against Airdrie wearing that. Um, and hopefully it just brings back memories. And I think there's a few jerseys in there that they won't have seen before mm -hmm. because I discovered a couple of jerseys I was totally unaware of. And then there's a few stories about them um, as well that they were designed by fans and I managed to track down the fans, believe it or not. Right. And they get a mention in the book as well. So they'll, they'll find out something new, but hopefully some great memories. Well, Paul, it's been great to talk to you today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's been great. Uncensored, unbiased, unmatched. The Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel.